This week's episode brought to you by Jeff Lipak, defender of freedom and cadets everywhere. Hello, and welcome to Communicore Weekly. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. You did it again. You I know. Again. I was going to see if you were going to catch it. I did. And it, every time you do it, you throw me off because I'm such a cre- you know creature of habit that <laughs> my entire a, thing is messed up. <laughs> I'm such a creature of habit, too. So, yes, this is Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Oh, thank, thank you. Now we can continue recording and not now it mess feels anything like normal. up. Yes, okay. good. Okay. Back to normal. Back to normal. <laughs> Before we jump into the show, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Benjamin and Mason. I wanted to say hello. Hi, guys. Hey. Hey. All right. So. Let's uh, let's jump into the history segment. It's time for Disney history. One of the goals, or one of the original goals of Epcot Center was to entertain and enlighten and educate all the guests that came through its doors. Now, not only through e-ticket level attractions, but also through the technology that was presented to guests uh, for their use while they're in the park. So back in 1992, home computers were kind of frightening and almost non-existent. And a lot of the reason that Epcot Center offered so many computer-based shows and attractions was not only because of corporate sponsors, but because of the innate love of technology that Walt Disney fostered in the company and in his ideas for Epcot Center to begin with. So Richard Beard, in his seminal 1982 edition of Walt Disney's Epcot, you know, I'm talking about a book, I know it's not the book of the week, but still. Uh, throwing me he off talks again. About, throwing me off I know, again. throwing me off again. <laughs> he talks about computers and the philosophy that the creators of Epcot wanted to get across, so to speak, with a lot of the Communicore pavilions, and here's the quote from the book. It sounds forbidding, but even if you don't understand the first thing about computers, through curiosity, fascination, or maybe even out of desperation, you're going to walk up to one of those infernal machines, you're going to touch it in the appropriate place, and you're going to find out exactly what you wanted to know. As opposed to You'll the inappropriate the... place? Hey, you... yeah, there's been inappropriate places on a computer. Okay, yeah, jam your finger in that USB port. No, no, okay, anyway. Um... <laughs> Go on with the quote. <laughs> exactly, thank you. So, Okay. All right, so you'll, you'll test out all of its capabilities, and pretty soon you're going to like it so much that you'll wish you had a computer in your own home. And who knows? Someday you may. Welcome to the 21st century. And, and now I have, like, what, four of them? Exactly. I was thinking, looking around at me, at, at, you know, the our iPhones are more powerful than the computers they had back then. That's true. But you got to remember, back in 1982, I mean, they talked about how scary these things were. Nobody knew what to do with them. Yes, exactly, so. exactly. So one of the, the early ideas for Epcot were the, the world key information systems that were jointly developed by Disney and Bell Labs, or AT&T. And uh, in the book, uh, From the Spirit of Epcot, uh, Center, I'm sorry, From the Spirit of Epcot Center in 1992, there's a quote that says, Within Earth Station, at the conclusion of the trip, is the principal source for Epcot Center information. Here, and in various locations throughout Epcot Center, information is offered in a method keeping with Epcot Center technology restaurant reservations, lost children information, entertainment show schedules, and more can be attained with just a touch of a video screen known as the World Key Network. Hey, so how did the World Key work? Magic. Well, it was, it was, it was magic. Disney magic. Limited time. Limited to, it was limited time Disney magic. <laughs> yes, so, okay. Um, I love some of the descriptive words that are used. It, w- it was a combination of microelectronics, different from, I guess, macroelectronics, Computer software, laser video disc, wow, television, touch sensitive screens, and fiber optic transmission. Uh, the World Key Information System was actually a network of six mini computers and 29 guest terminals located throughout Epcot. Uh, information was stored uh, either on an interactive video desk, disc or in a computer database. Wow, lovely. Uh, there were 86 video disc players for use in the system that were connected to the guest terminals via fiber optic transmission system. 
and if the guests needed special assistance, they could also talk to a Royal Key attendant via a two-way audio-video conversation. And you know, something else I thought about, with 86 Laserdisc players, that might have been the largest concentration of Laserdisc players anywhere in the world. Yeah, that's kind of unbelievable. And considering all that information on those 86 Laserdiscs can be contained within an iPhone and then some now, that's kind of insane. Yes. Now, yes. It, nowadays, you you know, with the ability to book dining reservations 180 days in advance, you, you might wonder why the World Key system was so important. Because, you know, back in the day, you could only make a reservation for a restaurant the day you were in that theme park. So Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, it must have been That's nuts. <laughs> so during those uh, first few years, Epcot Center followed the same policy as the Magic Kingdom for dining reservations. You were kind of expected to rush to the place you wanted to eat of your choice to procure a reservation for a time later on that day. And then you can actually go about the rest of your day. There were actually no reservations allowed in advance. But back in 1984, the official uh, Broombam Guide uh, recommended that you arrive at the entrance to Epcot Center an hour and a quarter before the advertised opening. That was just to get a dining reservation. That's crazy. Yeah, I've talked to people who said, yeah, they lined up just to use one of the world keys for a half hour or longer to get a restaurant reservation. That's a long time to be standing in front of a screen like that while you're at a theme yeah. park. And now we've got my Magic Plus. Go figure. Hey, go figure. So, okay. Well, both the Burnbaum guides and the unofficial guides recommended that you make a beeline for the world key kiosk, the very first thing at Epcot. Uh, Birnbaum suggested the ones located inside Earth Station at the base of, uh, you know, Spaceship Earth. And in the unofficial guide, Salinger recommends that you hoof it to the World Key kiosk located outside of the Earth Station on the walkway to World Showcase. Both guides discussed the issue of waiting for a long time to make the reservations with the system. And you could also access a kiosk outside of the Germany Pavilion. Now, by 1989, if you were actually staying at a Walt Disney World hotel or one of the Good Neighbor hotels, you can make a reservation for, get this, two days in advance. You're That's kicking nice. it up a notch. That's nice. In 1993, you can make a reservation for three days in advance. And then sometime before 1994, reservation could be made 30 days in advance. Uh, priority seating would be available by 1997 for up to 60 days in advance. So. Why, why is all that important? Well, it kind of shows the evolution of Disney dining and kind of foreshadows what will happen to the World Key kiosk. The, the wonderful sociological treatise on Walt Disney World, it's a book called Vinyl Leaves by Stephen M. Fellman, which there's a silent J in there, discusses the World Key kiosk. silent Bob. Yeah, silent Bob with a silent J. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay, so he talks about the World Key Kiosk, in his words, technically and humanistically. And the book, you know, I reviewed it a while ago, is one of the few places that offers a semi-technical breakdown of the kiosk and some other amazing things. So here goes a real quick breakdown of it. Although the television monitors boast what are called touch-sensitive screens, the viewer never actually touches the screen, which is protected by an impact-resistant, weather-tight, transparent plastic shield. Infrared light emitting diodes form a pattern about one quarter of an inch in front of the screen. So when a fing person's finger touches the plastic protective shield, some of the tiny beams in this matrix of light are interrupted, allowing the computer to identify the exact coordinates of the spot touched. A microprocessor computes the location at which the beam was interrupted and sends this data to a computer. The computer uses this information to determine which video and audio sequences to display. All I can think is, you know, I'm glad my iPhone touchscreen displays a lot better than that. It's way too complicated so, for me. <laughs> yeah, you probably couldn't pinch to zoom no, on the roll key. No, and if, and if you tried to pinch it, I'm sure it didn't work at all for probably, anything. Probably screened. They would probably kick you out of the park. Probably would, so. So, thankfully, this actually is not the end of the world key kiosk story to find out what happens to them you're gonna have to stick around for the five like a goat so you got a little while guys he's a nerd he's a geek but we all like to hear him speak so listen up to the words from his speech it's george's book of the week the art of tron by michael bonifer Copyright 1982 with 64 pages. Now, I wasn't familiar with this author when the book came in and did a little bit of research on it. He started working for Disney in 1980 as a publicist for Tron. He was one of the founding producers for the Disney Channel and was actually the first producer ever to use a beta cam in a television series. And he was also the first to shoot underwater scenes in Betamax on the movie Splash 
which of course has no relation to Splash Mountain. None at sadly. all. Minus all. the name. So, minus the name. <laughs> so, and he also helped create a lot of artwork for Disney home videos and Disney's first websites for their film releases. So I thought that was a pretty interesting career path for him. Okay, so the book, The Art of Tron, was released in concert with the groundbreaking film, and it's an interesting look at the film for a few reasons. Uh, one, it's firmly grounded in 1982 terminology, which is quite charming and laughable at the same time. Uh, it's also a making of book for a highly experimental film at a time when there weren't a lot of books dedicated to the art of filmmaking, and like the discussion we had about the World Key Kiosk earlier, uh, it was produced at a time when computers were very scary and not a lot was known about how they worked. You know, I'm still wondering, do I have little people running around the inside of mine? I got a hamster in mine. You got a hamster keeps you going? Okay, yep. that makes sense. That makes sense. So, Okay, well, the book is divided into 25 small sections that look at the pre-production and characters. Surprisingly, a very small part of the book looks at the development of the film. But when you get into the rest of the sections, you get a really great history of the film, the people, and the companies involved. Uh, there's a ton of concept artwork for the various stages of production that not only shows the evolution of the film, but also computer the, the computer graphics that were used. And it's a pretty amazing story about a group of artists that experimented the entire time that the film was being made. Um, one of the more interesting stories that... Uh, that I read was about the creation of the light cycles and many of the animation from Magi, which was the Mathematical Applications Group, Inc., one of three uh, different computer companies that were used to make graphics for this. Well, it was taking several days to get the, compu the completed computer animated film from the New York studios to the Disney studios in Burbank. So Disney would receive the footage, evaluate it, and return it to New York to be changed or redone. Then Magi would have to redo the whole thing and send it back, so it was quite a process. Well, Magi installed a computer terminal in Burbank that was connected to a terminal in Magi in New York by a telephone line. And for all of our younger cadets out there, a telephone line is sort of like an iPhone that's connected to another iPhone by a cord. <laughs> I know it's very archaic. I mean, imagine not being able to walk more than three or four feet away from your phone. Is this when you had to walk uphill in the snow to school snow without both issues? Both ways. Yeah. Yes, both ways. So, okay. So, <laughs> so, so Magi would then transmit the wireframe movies that were seen in Burbank that way. Uh, Disney could offer suggestions and changes without all the work needing to be done. And then Magi could redo the scenery and fully animate it. And according to the animators and the artists, this saved about three days on each side. Uh, the book really is a fantastic look at Tron. We get to see all of the major characters, the ships, the vehicles, and the different landscapes. And unlike a traditional film at the same time, all of the elements of the film, rather unwittingly, were treated like characters. And a lot of the names from the film are recognizable, like Mobius, Sid Mead, Steven Lisberger, and Jerry Reese, who is currently working in a lot of theme parks right now. Uh, that was not a shout-out to the Disney project, Jeff, so don't worry about it. Oh, good, because I still owe his money. You hear that, Glock? Yeah, yeah he needs his money. So, uh, <laughs> any, any fan of the film is going to want to hunt this book down, as well as anyone interested in the evolution of computer-enhanced and CGI-based films. It, it's a lot of fun. Um, it gives you a good idea of how they made movies back then and how they put together a book about a movie. This one is called The Art of Tron from 1982, and it's by Michael Bonifer. Yum, 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 yum. If you want to get to know your food, you got to have a food report. I'm going to apologize in advance for the both of us because we're going to totally butcher every single pronunciation for the rest of this uh, food report. So go ahead, George. You start first. <laughs> Great. Let me take the bullet. Yes, yes, because that's okay. what we do here. That's fine. I can handle that. Okay, so so this food report is for La Hacienda de San Angel, which is probably the best pronunciation we're going to do for this segment. Exactly. Uh, for, those of you, for those of you that may not be familiar with this restaurant, it's in the World Showcase side of Epcot in the Mexico Pavilion, or as I jokingly refer to it as New Mexico. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, yeah. Okay. No? Okay. Never mind. Anyway. So, it's the uh, little building, actually not so little of a building, that sort of sits on the lagoon itself and, uh, you know, uh, does uh, a different menu for lunch and dinner, which is kind of cool. But I think uh, we both experienced it once for dinner 
And uh, did you go a second time? Uh, I've been there at least to... three separate times for dinner. At least three separate times yes. for dinner. Okay, so we've got a few different things. So, um, well, I know on this particular occasion, we were both a, uh, attending a Mice Chat sponsored event. Yes, yes. So it was actually almost a year ago at this point. It was, it was. It's true. That's true. So, and I do remember fairly uh, well that I did get a premium margarita. I got the mango blueberry basil. Yes, and margarita. then I got the orange mango fire margarita, which yes. I usually, anything that has to do with fire or spicy, I do not do because <laughs> I, I'm very sensitive. However, <laughs> this was quite delicious. Yes, yeah, mine was very well, very well. I, I will say that somebody had promised to pay for my drink, and, and this still has never come through. But I won't. I won't call any names out. He's not That's talking about me, guys. So no, it wasn't. It wasn't Jeff. No, it wasn't Jeff. That Somebody may have sounded there. like a subtle jab because at first I was like, "Wait, is he talking about me?" But then I remembered, <laughs> no, that was not me. Not at all. Not at all. So after that, we did go to the tequila bar, but that's something different yes, altogether. That's a so, different review that um, we don't remember. No, no, not at all. Not at all. I remember not being extremely hungry that evening, and I know I think I got the I got the appetizer, actually, what they're called like entremeses something like that but i got the sopa de frijo which was like um no no that's not what i got i got no. botana that's what it was it was botana yeah because it was it was it was it was a tostada and it was uh i because it was a sopa that confused me so pay not so pie i got marinated pork and a cheese empanada which was good i mean i thought the i thought the food was really good i enjoyed it uh didn't seem any better from any other mexican fare at a restaurant you know sit down restaurant in my area Except the margarita. Yeah, they don't offer margaritas like that. Yeah, yeah. These I were giant size. I got the uh, costillas on salsa de chili, which was the, the, the braised short ribs, and there was potato and uh, a chili there, obviously. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty good. Um, I thought, you know, being from mm -hmm. Jersey, I think it was a step above the usual stuff <laughs> I would get around there. Um but I'm not really a Mexican food guy to begin with, but I actually do happen to enjoy that restaurant quite a bit. Maybe it's yeah. the margarita talking, but <laughs> maybe it's the margarita. <laughs> I did enjoy well, that meal. I, I know it's 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 a it's a beautiful restaurant. Uh, really done a great job with it. Really heavy dark wooden furniture with the 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 light stucco walls. Um, of course, did take a bathroom break there. I think we had we were of texting course. each other photos yes, of we the were. signs of the signs for the bathrooms. That's it. Yes, that's nothing all. Else. This, nothing else. Nothing else. Thanks for not um, making this weird. <laughs> exactly. Not at all. Well, I was thinking about it today. I was look at these two different restaurants that were almost 30 years apart. You know, you've got the San Angel Inn, you know, inside the Mexico Pavilion itself, which is rather, uh, it's like the Blue Bayou. You know, you walk into, it's one of my favorite pavilions, the Mexico Pavilion, because you walk in and you're suddenly in a Mexican market uh, in the evening. And they've done a great job with it. And it's a fully themed restaurant like that. But then you go across the street to the San uh, La Hacienda, we shall call it, <laughs> before you get anywhere else. And, it, and it's more like a typical, uh, I guess it was themed more like what you would expect a Mexican restaurant to be like. Yeah, like anywhere yes. in America, you can go to a place that looks just like this and mm -hmm. get essentially the same stuff. But you get um, the same food. You can't get illuminations over there. Where, exactly. Wherever you are, you can get illuminations here when you go to this one. Mm -hmm. But you know, I just thought it was neat to think that you know, 30 years later, they transform from trying to create a fully themed environment to just creating a very well done and beautiful sit down restaurant. Yes, yes, I agree. So, it was but, good. Um, I've not seen illuminations from there. I have not either, and I think we should so, at some point just to experience. I think we it. should. But um, okay, so should we, you know, see if Disney will call us and set up something for us? Well, we can, you know, we can make reservations now, 180 days in advance. So we should That's give true. them a call right now. Okay, instead of using the World Key kiosk. Yeah, because you know they, you know, we can't use them <laughs> right now. Do you, do you want to find <laughs> well, out what happened to them? We can, we can find out what happened could, to them. We could do a five leg ago, couldn't we? Let's let's move on to that then and talk about that. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? Five -legged <laughs> All right, I know you've been waiting the entire show to find out what happened to these things, so let's let's talk about them. The uh, the World Key <laughs> Kiosk they were actually moved in 1994 when Earth Station was closed and was replaced by the uh, the Global Neighborhood, and the kiosks were moved to an area to the side of guest relations. 
but uh, they were unfortunately they were officially put out of their their misery and on March 21st <laughs> 1999 you, you can actually still see the area today where the world kiosks were located because you can head over to guest services and look on the left side before you enter and you kind of have to look past the benches and beyond the planters there because you know they put planters there when stuff is closed and uh, <laughs> there's some lights in the overhang and some speakers or vents or some something else over there I'm, I'm not sure yeah but but pay no attention to the potted plants. They're they're not really there to keep you out. Uh, no, well, no, not at yeah, all. No, no, not at all, not at all. So, well, you can you can obviously still see the detail of where the kiosks were, and you know we we assume that they're still back there, boarded up behind the wood panels, and I really hope they took the people out. Yeah, those video disc Ugh. people. That'd be awkward That's if not. True. <laughs> so the the next time you're at Epcot, meander over to the World Key kiosks and see if you can finally snag that reservation. For the La Cellier cafeteria. Spoiler, because you, you won't. do know it was a cafeteria first. I, so. At first, it was a cafeteria, and now <laughs> it's now it's a two Less. dining credit uh, experience. Just for their cheese soup, apparently. Yes, it is good, but not yeah, it is. two it dining is. credit good. I'm sorry. <laughs> not quite, not quite. So. Well, guys, thank you so much for watching and listening to us. Yeah, be sure to leave us a comment and rate us on iTunes. Yes, we need more nine stars. More. Uh, email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicorweekly. Yep, see lots of pictures of stuff we put up there. Uh, follow us on Twitter. I'm at Imaginerding and at Jeff Heinbuck. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram as well. Heck yes, same, same names. That's right, you said last time, same names. It's it's kind of crazy how that works. Kind of crazy. I'm glad so. another Jeff Heinbuck didn't take the Instagram Jeff Heinbuck. That would have been that, weird. That would have been really weird. Really, really weird. Would be really weird. You can also uh, give us a call, leave us a message on the Communicor Weekly hotline at 424-785-GOAT. Ooh, goat. Or 4628, but I like goat better. Yeah, goat anyway. sounds cooler. And don't forget, there are still spaces open for the Communitor. In case you haven't heard, we're going to have a week-long tour of Southern California, April 27th through May 2nd, 2014. And to find out information, go to fairygodmothertravel.com and you'll see special events. Click on that to request a quote. And for Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Lysine.